Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Our topic for today is toxic mold and mycotoxins and how this can make us sick and what to do about it with Bridget Danner. Bridget Danner has been a licensed acupuncturist since 2004 and a certified functional diagnostic practitioner since 2015. Her interest in natural health grew from an interest in protecting the environment. Bridget now educates about toxins and detox through her online community and coaches women on how to detox through a functional medicine approach. Bridget has also published a book on this topic, The Ultimate Toxic Mold Recovery Guide. Bridget, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I love talking about mold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, please tell us about your personal journey with, with your health and your experience with mold illness. Yeah, so I, I moved to Portland, Oregon to start my practice and uh, didn't really know anything about mold or anything like that. Um, you know, it's a wet climate. I think a lot of the homes there have mold, actually. Uh, so the second, second or third home I, I lived in, um, I, yeah, I was having increasing symptoms, like working on my health a lot. It would sort of get better and then worse again. Uh, it was kind of hard to pin down because there's so many different symptoms and mostly people would just tell me, oh, it's stress. Uh, you know, I started studying functional medicine. I worked on my gut. I, you know, had a really clean diet. Um, but then I just tanked again and uh, started getting some IV therapy and um, seeing some naturopaths and it just wasn't getting better. And they that was the first time someone finally mentioned to me you know, what about your home? Has anything changed in your environment? And that's the first time mold kind of came up as a question, which I think many of us who have these mold stories have one of those moments where you're like, oh, is, could it be mold? Uh, <laughs> and that, no, you know, that, that's opens... always kind of a tricky question too, when you're talking to clients, because a lot of times they, they're not aware that there's any mold. No, you know, most mold, I, you know, I've made a lot of mold inspector friends now. And most mold isn't visible. It's in the walls. Uh, for us in our home, yeah, we had very, very little visible mold. Uh, but I did know that we had uh, a musty basement and a basement that it had a little water intrusion. So that I did know. And then we got an inspector. And then our house, like many homes, had more than one place where water had like intruded and mold had grown. So that can be part of the problem is it's, it's, if you have a whole big home, it's often not just one area, you know, there's been something in the attic and the crawl space and the basement and the windows. And so, um, that was the case for us and, uh, the start of a big <laughs> journey of cleaning up the house and working on our health and all that. And uh, it's not an easy thing to get rid of mold, huh? No. You know, if you have a widespread problem and your health has really been affected, it's kind of worst case scenario for your finances because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't really keep much. And I hate to tell people that. I mean, if you, if you have generally a good home and maybe you just had a brand new incident in the bathroom that you take care of right away, you're not going to lose all your belongings or anything, but if you've been living for a long time in mold, it's affected all your belongings. It's affects all those porous areas or even uh, like little nooks and crannies and non-porous things like refrigerators and computers. So uh, it becomes very hard to clean those things. So we really lost everything i have like two tupperware bins maybe i only have one tupperware bin left now of like important documents like that's all i have from that whole time in my life so it's a lot of grief there's a lot of shock that you're dealing with the same time that your health isn't good yeah um 
What about the fact that some people are just not sensitive to mold? Do you think, you know, because a lot of times you might have four people in a family and one is really sick and maybe one or two they haven't noticed anything. Is it, do you, do you think that they're actually affected and just don't know it or they're just, by their body's able to get rid of it and it just doesn't affect them? Yeah, I, I kind of think both things are true. So some people do just detox better genetically or they're younger or just, uh, you know, whatever's happened so far in their life positions them better to identify and clear toxins. Like my son, for example, was basically born in that home. He had a huge mold colony under his floor. Uh, really, no, we really, you know, he and he did, to your point, he, you know, when we finally much later tested his urine, he did have mycotoxins, but he never really presented. So I think sometimes we're sort of, we do have them, but we're living with them fairly successfully. I think it can catch up with you though, too. Like some people are just very hardy and they don't really sort of notice things going on with their body. Maybe Even some things people like, just make friends with the mold, you know? Kind of, but then you could also, <laughs> you know, be ending up with cancer, you know, out right. of the blue. Right. But you, you know, you've right. been in a moldy yeah, house for 20 stuff, years. Right? Yep. Yeah. So it is connected with some long-term diseases too. Yeah. Autoimmune diseases, hormonal problems, thyroid. Alzheimer's is a big connection they know about now too, which yeah. is something we're all Yeah. Dr. Of, Bredesen really. talks about mycotoxins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you talk about what are some of the most common symptoms related to mycotoxins? So I think the two biggest ones are fatigue and brain fog. Those are pretty common and you pretty much, you know, hear those reported the most. Um, it's from the mitochondria and the brain being affected. And then from there, it could be so many different things. Uh, digestive issues, probably, probably right up there. Lots of food sensitivities. Um, chronic pain and headaches, weight gain, hormone problems, mood issues, uh, because it's a toxin that can affect and travel in so many places in the body and affects the immune system. Uh, that's why there can be just so many different types of symptoms. So, right. um, you know, that, that sound, it sounds a little ridiculous. How could it be causing all these things, but it really can. Yeah, it's just kind of similar to a virus. You know, if it hits your GI tract, you're going to have GI symptoms. If it hits your brain, you know, you're going to have more brain symptoms. So, yeah, you know, to be, you know, I don't work with a lot of long haul COVID, um, but uh, when I hear about it and read about it, it, it's pretty similar in some of its effects. It's this chronic inflammation. Right. Uh, so that's kind of what mold creates, too. Yeah, and mold seems to also adversely affect the immune system in the similar way that viruses do also. Yeah, for sure. Creates a lot of confusion and, um, you know, like you said, it can lead to autoimmunity. Um, so uh, when you suspect one of your patients may have been exposed to, you know, they're showing symptoms that might, might be related to mold illness, to mycotoxins, um, how do you recommend they go about testing your home and or office? Yeah, so this is tricky one because it depends if you rent or you own and, you know, your budget. Uh, let's just say hypothetically. Let's say, let's say you own your home. Yeah, let's say you're a homeowner. Uh, you know, in the end, you're going to you're going to need a mold inspector to see what the source is and a good one. But, right. if you, but do you recommend maybe starting with something less expensive? Uh, because what I have found is sometimes when you first start talking to a patient about this, if they're not aware of there being any mold, um, they're going to be a little apprehensive about spending thousands of dollars until they really know that there's something there. You can. Um, I don't think it's like foolproof to do some DIY testing when you've never done it before, but there's a company called Immunolytics that you can buy these plates and swabs and they'll tell you how to position them around the house. Uh, right. It's very affordable. They'll do a consultation with you. Uh, so that's, that's a decent option. Um, Have you used the ERMI testing? Yeah, I personally, I don't think the ERMI results on their own give you much insight. Um, okay. 
but there's a friend of mine who has something called the ERMI code where you can take your ERMI results and it's pretty affordable. They'll put them into their kind of supercomputer because they've analyzed so many homes. So f with that information, you can say mm -hmm. this is uh, this is a high risk home or that kind of thing. But th because the army wasn't designed for a residential home owner situation, okay, the test is very difficult to read uh, for okay. the average person. So for for those who are listening who aren't aware, army is a way to test the dust in the house to see if there's evidence of of mycotoxins, right? Yes, but it was designed for some kind of governmental use first before you know the public sort of caught on to it so, so that's why the results are is there are another way to that you can test the dust in your house there's one other test called the emma that tests for specifically mycotoxins so i like that in this terms of being a health practitioner like the army is just telling you kind of overall mold load not all the strains are toxic right. blah 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 right. The Emma at least is telling you about toxicity. I wouldn't say their uh, report or their consultation is very interesting. Like it's very basic. It's just sort of like yes right. or no. Right. So um, yeah, it's tough because there's a, a lot of questions in this space about what's best and there isn't an easy answer. Right, but maybe it's a good first step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the cheapest first step, well, even before you play test, just walk around your home. You know, I have that in my book is like, look, you know, you can say, oh, there's no there's no water in my home. Well, like, think about it. Look around, look under your, you know, under your sink. Have you I mean, most people probably never been in their crawl space. And I had someone on my mold summit. He said 100 percent of crawl spaces are moldy. 100%. He's wow. never seen one not. So there's just areas of our home we don't check. You know, right. signs of like a brown line or a white crusty line, uh, you know, right. mold around your bathtub. So if you, that's the first thing you can do that's totally free is, is start looking around. Okay. And then when, when you get an inspector, how do you know you're getting the right inspector and what should the inspector be doing? <sighs> yeah. I mean, I think you can read reviews, you can ask questions. So they should be taking multiple sample types, um, not just one air sample. So they should be like swabbing. They can do a, a moisture meter of the wa wall, which you can also buy yourself. Um, they're gonna look for like how things are draining, how your gutters are draining, if there's any water around your foundation. So basically you want somebody who's really thorough and investigating in many ways. I've definitely heard these stories where somebody just walks in and they're like, looks good to me and then leaves. <laughs> and that's like, that's I don't probably, know what that's, that's about. That's probably the inspector sent by the apartment manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, And I think in this space, and it'll happen slowly, but like some of my friends in this space are starting to offer some training programs and stuff for, so that, you know, people in those situations can be more informed about how to properly inspect. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but I'd like to take a minute to tell you about a new product that I'm very excited about. I'd like to tell you about a new wearable called the Apollo. And this is a device that can be worn on the wrist or the ankle, and it uses vibrations to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And this device has amazing benefits in terms of uh, getting you out of that stressed out sympathetic nervous system and stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. It has a number of different functions, especially helping you to relax, to focus, to concentrate, to get into a deeper meditative state, even to help you sleep. And there's even a mode to help you wake up. And this all occurs through the uh, scientific use of subtle vibrations uh, for those of you who might be interested in getting the Apollo for yourself to help you um, reset your nervous system, go to apolloneuro.com and use the um, affiliate code WHITES10. That's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z-10. And now back to the discussion. And then once they do find mold, what are some of the hints for what needs to be done for proper remediation? So 
there really much isn't a way to avoid like actually cutting it out and removing. I think that we tend to want to save money by, oh, can we put bleach on it or paint over it? That's not how it works. So if there's materials like drywall, carpet that have been affected, they need to be just completely removed and then re-drywalled and the area cleaned and, and you know, different steps. So I would say just don't think you can skip the step of just old fashioned, like it's a construction project. Right. And then you've got to make sure they get all of it out, right? Yeah. And then afterwards, you know, be cleaning your air ducts and surfaces. You can use like a, a soapy or um, essential oil based cleaner. Some surfaces need to be like sanded before they're cleaned. Like if there's been, you know, wood beams, you can't really just like wipe those with soap. You have to actually sand them a bit and then clean them. And then, like we mentioned earlier, depending on the extent of it and the extent of your ill health, you have to think about, you know, is my couch that's been sitting in this room for 10 years harboring mold and mycotoxins? So you can potentially put a plate on that and test it uh, is one option. Uh, or another thing you can do, for instance, like with your clothes or books, you can put them in storage and then revisit them in a few months. Um, that's what we did like when we moved. Uh, we put some things in storage that we still kind of hoped we could keep. As soon as we opened that storage unit, it was like instantly sick. So, you know, I knew, okay, I can't keep these things. But sometimes you're not ready to just give stuff up, right? Right, but generally things that are porous like furniture and carpets, are going to be and mattresses very likely going to have mycotoxins, correct? Yeah. So you're pretty much going to need to get rid of them, unfortunately, right? Yeah, unless, like I said, if this is just some new incident that you catch right away, that's a different right. story. This okay. is more like a chronic thing, yeah. Right. And then, what about clothing? How? What's the best way to wash and and demold your clothing? Well, you can potentially use uh, borax in your laundry or th there's a few other products out there. I think one's called like EC3 or something like that. Honestly, like I couldn't really save any of my clothes. I think I've saved, you know, five items because I would wash them and do these things and then I'd put my face up to them and they'd give me a headache. So, um, and then you're affecting your washing machine. So. I feel like, you know, you can spend a lot of time spinning your wheels trying to clean things and then realize it didn't work, but it could work. <laughs> so <laughs> something. And do you, do you recommend that people move out or do you think is, as long as they put up plastic sheets and stuff, it's okay to live in the house while it's being remediated? I think while it's being remediated, you should definitely not be there. I and mean, that's a big mistake that I made that made me a lot sicker. And now, to be honest, my remediator could have been more conscientious of protocols, but they just aren't all, they just aren't all. And some of us aren't, don't really know what we're getting into. Um, and if you decide to move out, how do you know? wherever you're going, you know, whether you're going to stay in someone else's home or apartment or a hotel room, how do you know that place is going to be mold free? Yeah. I mean, you don't know for sure, but you can do that visual inspection again, or your kind of five senses inspection. Um, you know, don't move into a basement apartment. Um, you know, there's some kind of simple things to kind of check. You can ask questions if you're Generally, it's not recommended to try to go by immediately because it is pretty common that there's mold. And at this moment in time, you're very sensitive. So committing to a purchase right away is a bit risky. So it is kind of better to, you know, live with family, live in your RV, whatever. But yeah, definitely re-exposures are pretty common. Um, you know, but they're not guaranteed, right? So like it really, frankly, took us moving out of state to be in an environment we felt was safer. Um, but, you know, I've lived in two homes in Arizona now. I haven't had any problems. So I think it can feel like it's following you and it's everywhere. Um, but there, there will be a point where you get in a better home. But you have to maintain that home, right? Like 
you don't change your washer hose, which many of us don't even think about, eventually it's going to crack and fail. So a lot of this is just learning about home maintenance and, um, yeah, because as long as we live in homes, there's always a chance of, you know, floods, plumbing errors, that kind of thing. Yeah, one of the things I noticed in California is they try really hard to make homes um, airtight so you don't necessarily get moisture in. But then if there is any moisture, it's, the, you know, the, the homes don't, the walls don't breathe that well. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, opening windows and doors is a super easy thing to do to let let moisture out and let clean air in. I mean, even probably in LA, indoor air quality is worse than outdoor air quality now because of everything like off gassing in our homes. So right. yeah, I'm a big fan of just like opening up the home. Right. So what other health conditions do you find most frequently uh, mold is an underlying cause of or a factor in? Uh, definitely, like I mentioned, digestive issues, like chronic digestive issues. I think you should look for mold if you just can't seem to be getting over things and your practitioner is like, you've got parasites, you've got candida, all this stuff. Uh, Lyme disease is really closely associated uh, with mold. Again, so Hashimoto's, there's often a connection there. Um, let me think what else. Um, and then just a lot of like symptomatic stuff. I think, well, I'll, I'll speak to hormones because I think we never think about hor hormones being caused uh, by mold. You think, oh, it's stress or my diet or, or what have you, but it's a, you know, they, they can lodge in your hypothalamus pituitary access and inflame it. So you're getting like top down dysregulation of your hormones, plus your liver's burdened, your gut's probably off. Um, so yeah, if you're having chronic symptoms of, you know, low libido, weepiness, gaining weight, irregular periods, any of that, it's totally possible that mold's involved. Um, so what about testing the person for mold? Yeah, luckily it's a pretty toxins. easy at home urine test. Right. Uh, and there's a few good companies who do that. Yeah, I know you mentioned uh, Great Plains and Vibrant. Yeah, I think those are the two top ones. I think both of those you need to go through a practitioner, but I think that's best anyhow, because just like what I mentioned the ERMI, it's hard to read. You know, you're going to get your own mold results and you're not going to know, like, is this really bad? Is this not bad? What do I do about it? You're going to have a million questions. Now, I, I noticed in your book, you were explaining how each one of those tests tests a certain number of mycotoxins related to a certain number of species of mold. But of course, there's so many different species of mold and so many different forms of mycotoxins that I guess uh, either of those tests could miss some of the mycotoxins that might be there. So, yeah, I think there are the few different tests all have like a bit of their strengths and weaknesses and like different strains they test. So I think like I think there's one company that will catch like stacky botries better than another. Uh, some practitioners will have you run a few different tests for that reason. Okay. But there's actually only like a dozen or so categories of mycotoxins. So there's many, many types, but there's actually only about 12 toxic moles and about 12 ish mycotoxin groups. So okay. I think that's how they're able to, you know, not test as many. Right. And I noticed you said you like to do provocation. Yeah, I've got, you know, I've gotten a, a little trouble for some of that. So now we just say use the sauna or fast. Um, we did okay. say use yeah, the glutathione. We don't say that I, I know Great Plains says not to do provocation. Yeah. So I would say we do light provocation now, yeah. which is just an overnight fast or sauna. Oh, okay. So I know other practitioners who recommend glutathione as a provocative agent. I just talked to somebody from Great Plains recently and they said, well, you know, the the glutathione can bind to the mycotoxins and then you, you might not find them in the urine. Yeah, that's kind of what they told me too. You know, we were recommending it because that's kind of what I had been taught or heard right. was best. You know, we, of course we want to find things. We don't want people to right. get false negatives, but I have one client who took 
NAC, so precursor. Right. She was in a moldy home and her first test was negative. Then when she was out, she had a positive test with another company and she wasn't happy. So it could have been that or it could have been just that she wasn't pushing out mold while she lived in that moldy home. I, I guess I like we can't say for sure. But I, after that experience, I was like, OK, I guess we should just be care be more cautious and not use. Yeah, I wasn't that. sure if I understood because it, it was not my understanding that glutathione binds to mycotoxins necessarily. I think it can, because besides being an antioxidant, it is like it can bind in the liver as like a okay. detoxifier. But I think what they told me on the phone was that they measure. What did they say? Like they measured the mycotoxins by weight. And if there was some binding of glutathione, it could change the weight and then it wouldn't be measured. Something like that. Yeah, I've always sort of understood that the glutathione helps to stimulate the detoxification process, and then it's the binder that it really attaches to. Yeah, yeah, I think potentially, you know, you could do glutathione a few days before. Yeah. Um, but, you know, besides that one person, I never experienced a false negative. Uh, right. We see tons of positives. You know, it's pretty rare to ever see a negative, which is why I feel like that one case was a little odd. Right. So um, uh, let's go into your recommendations for treatment of mold illness. <laughs> Sure. So first, you know, do the basics. First, don't be in a moldy home while you're trying to detox. It doesn't work. Um, be eating, you know, a whole food diet, be getting some exercise and sunlight and make sure you're sleeping, making sure you're pooping. So it's the kind of my readiness steps. And if you're doing OK on those, um, you can start pushing toxins a little more. I really love detox techniques like sauna and coffee enemas and dry brushing. Um, for me, when I was really sick, doing those kind of movement techniques helped me a lot. Uh, so I'm a big advocate for getting those in. Castor oil packs, uh, Epsom salt baths are some more options. Oh, where, where do you place the castor oil packs? I just do abdomen. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's a glutathione recycler and also like helps digestion. So and then I usually do some essential oils with it when I do it at home. Right. Um, um, <clears throat> I know she's talked about a math diet. Yeah, that's an acronym I made up at one point because people are always asking what to eat. <laughs> so uh, it's microbiome friendly, anti-inflammatory, time restricted and hydrating. So it's kind of just a good base diet to be yeah. thinking about. Right. And you mentioned some essential supplementation you like everybody to be on before you go into the specific mold protocols. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. I think we kind of get excited about like sexy supplements we've heard of, like some new binder and all that. But, you know, really the liver needs nutrients. The brain needs certain nutrients to just work. And you, you know, it has, it's burdened. So getting B vitamins, getting magnesium, getting fish oil, um, I find sometimes people are skipping some of those basic nutrients. Uh, so I really recommend everybody be on those really for life, you know, our, just our soil quality, our diet, our stressors, um, just sort of, we have more demand for those things than ever. Yeah. I would pretty much consider those things baseline nutrition for pretty much everybody as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's go into the, some of the specific detox, uh, treatment protocols. How do we get rid of the mycotoxins? Sure. This was a little tough to organize because everybody's obviously a little different on how they're going to react. So I just sort of picked my top favorite detox supplements. Uh, those are binders, electrolytes, CoQ10, uh, broccoli seed and sprout. And I'm missing one. <laughs> Glutathione. Glutathione. Thank you. And you also mentioned CoQ10. <laughs> yeah, I like CoQ10 a lot. Uh, a lot of times your mitochondria are really affected by the toxicity. And so your cells are tired. You're tired. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of based it on things that I really observed helped me quite a bit. So, um, why let's go into some of the rationale so you like coq10 
for um, mitochondrial support. Yes, and it's a general good antioxidant. It has a lot of different like functions. So I think we think about detox just like the liver, but it's also creating a lot of oxidative stress. So I'm a big fan of antioxidants. And then why electrolytes? So electrolytes came up because one thing that happens often when you have mold is you make less of a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. So you're peeing more often potentially and losing minerals that way. Also, we hope you're using your sauna. So, you know, just staying hydrated. So our particular electrolyte, we just add some extra B vitamins, antioxidants, so that, you know, because you can take a very basic electrolyte and that's fine. Uh, but I figured if we're formulating one for people going through this, we give it a little extra boost. Uh, do you particularly like infrared sauna? Uh, I do like infrared sauna, but I also advocate for just getting in any sauna. Um, just sweating. You know, yeah. You know, when I was first sick, I didn't have my own sauna. I was using saunas at a gym. You know, this was before COVID. Um, and they were kind of old fashioned and they would make me feel amazing. So <laughs> I think uh, infrared is great. Far infrared is the best, you know, wavelength for detox. But um you know, there's a lot of sauna options out there now, which is great. And we have to be realistic about everybody's budget. You know, not everyone can afford a super high end sauna. And then uh, what's the rationale for glutathione and broccoli seed extract? So glutathione, the most uh, prevalent antioxidant in the body, it does, it's sort of like leading the charge on oxidative stress and some detoxification in the liver, like we talked about. So if everything's sort of working normally, it recycles itself and everything's in balance. But if you've been in chronic mold, it's going to probably be depleted. It's, you know, it's it's needing to be restored. So that's there just to, to restore that. You know, some people may react differently to glutathione. Some people it's too much for them, what have you. But it's always been pretty neutral. For What's your favorite think. glutathione supplement? Well, we make one, so I guess I'll do a little myth busting that I think there's a lot of talk like it has to be liposomal or IV is best. Um, it just has to be absorbed. So I think there's more and more like ways to. Right. Because a long time ago, we were told glutathione does not get absorbed through the gut. And so therefore any oral glutathione is not going to work. And so then we you know, thought you could only use IV and, and then at some point we realized, well, that's not really accurate. Exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, we sort of hear something from somebody and so our glutathione is uh, called S acetyl glutathione. So they just attach a group to the glutathione so that it, it stays on the glutathione in the gut and to the bloodstream and then kind of breaks off uh, in the bloodstream so it can go in the cell. So yeah, basically any way you're kind of making, I think if you just ingest straight glutathione, it will be kind of broken up in the stomach. But um, yeah, any way that they're making it more absorbable um, is, is what's important. Okay, and then broccoli seed extract. Yeah, this one's super interesting. So we were already yeah, using Not this. everybody includes that in their mold detox. It's a little, yeah, it's unusual. I first learned about it from just, de it detoxes a lot of chemicals like gasoline additives and stuff. Then I learned about it like during COVID. It's actually quite good for like your liver health where some of your immune cells mature. Uh, and then later I found out it's good for um, supporting the glucuronidation pathway where some mycotoxins are um broken down. So I was like, this is amazing because I already <laughs> love broccoli seed and sprout. They're very well tolerated. Um, and, you know, we want to decrease our overall toxic burden, which it does. And it helps the liver work more efficiently. It actually helps direct the liver to make more um, or direct your genes to like make more antioxidants. So it's just one of those things where like you read the, da the data on it and it's like pretty incredible. What about um, binders? What kind of binders should we use? Should we, are there certain binders work better for certain types of mycotoxins? Yeah, so there's been more 
reporting, I'll say, around which binders work for which mycotoxins. Most of that research was done in terms of like animal feed, you know, in animal industry, there's been a lot of issues with mycotoxins and animal health. So a lot of that research wasn't done for humans. Um, it was done for farming, but they now, I would say modern functional practitioners are sort of mining that data and saying, well, this is good for this, so this is good. I think that's really interesting. And when we made our binder, we just used some of that information to make sure we hit all categories of mycotoxins. But I think it's also a little dangerous because like, so let's say you get a urine test and it shows one or two types of mold. We don't know that that's the only thing you've been exposed to. It's just a snapshot. So, you know, you can play around with matching your type with the binder that goes with it, especially if you're sensitive. Like if you want to just use a single ingredient binder, right. you may want to play around with matching it or you can rotate. Uh, you can take charcoal and then pectin and then humic acid. You may not like all of them. Your body may not like all of them. So well, you can which play are around. some of your favorite binding binders? Um, I mean, I like charcoal. It's it's affordable and it gets the job done. It also kind of helps for like stomach upset and little stomach bugs. It can be a little constipating for people. It's never been for me, uh, right. but binders in general can be a little constipating for people. And then zeolite, is that a good one? Yeah, zeolite is good. It's kind of like a porous rock, if I remember correctly. Most of them are porous in some way or have a charge to pull toxins to them. So like the binder we formulated, we just sort of have a bit of a grab bag of just different types of binders so we can catch different things. I'd like to interrupt this fascinating discussion we're having for another few minutes to tell you about a, another really exciting product that has changed my life and the life of my family, especially as it pertains to getting good quality sleep. It's something called the Chili Pad, C-H-I-L-I-P-A-D. It can be found at the website, chilisleep.com, which is C-H-I-L-I-S-L-E-E-P.com. And so this product involves a water-cooled mattress pad that goes underneath your sheets and helps you maintain a constant temperature at night. If you've ever gotten woken up because the temperature has uh, changed, typically goes uh, gets warmer, um, this product will maintain your body at a very even temperature and it tends to promote uninterrupted quality um, deep and REM sleep, which is super important for healing and for overall health. And if you um, if you go to chillysleep.com and you use the affiliate code WHITES20, that's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z, 20, you'll get 20% off a chili pad. So check it out and let's get back to this discussion. Do you um, often or sometimes use uh, antifungal, um, natural antifungal agents um, while treating the mycotoxins? Yeah, usually I would do it as like a later step in a gut protocol. Okay. Once the body's kind of cleared some things, is improving, the immune system is getting stronger. I think doing it too soon isn't going to stick usually. And there's a lot of die off can be happening. Right. So what do you do if there's die off? Uh, you cut back on whatever you're taking for okay. sure. Um, you know, you could do an Epsom salt bath. I mean, in the moment, you know, you can do a binder, you can have an Advil if you need to, <laughs> but generally you want to, you know, back off and right. manage it differently. It's if you're having die off your body, if you're having die off symptoms, I'll say like you're getting headaches, you don't feel well from your detox, it's too much. Your body's not keeping up. So it's right. a detriment to you to get in that state for too long. Do you incorporate supplements to try to stimulate bile flow since a lot of times these toxins end up in the bile as part of how they get into the digestive tract? 
Yeah, I think those are good. Uh, we have artichoke in our binder for that. Um, coffee enemas will help facilitate that. Bitters help facilitate that. Uh, a lot of people have motility issues with mold, and I think there's some brain inflammation, like vagal nerve issues. So, yeah, I think you know stimulating everything to move is is often needed for these folks. Okay, um, I noticed you also mentioned in your book. Um, Epsom salt bath, dry brushing, and mouth taping. Yeah, yeah. Mouth taping probably sounds like the weirdest one, but it was really <laughs> helpful for me. I was, I didn't know it, but I was like a mouth breather when I slept, and now my immune system was depleted. So I would wake up with sore throats like all the time, and it would take me hours to, you know, feel better again. Uh, and so then I saw a video about mouth taping and I was like, oh, it sounds like something basically it's just putting like a, a little bandage over your mouth at night. So you breathe through your nose. Right. Uh, it's so simple, but it makes more nitric oxide. It helps you sleep better. It's good for your oral hygiene, your immune system. Uh, so, again, because it really did make a difference for me, I put it in my top five. OK. And then. Um... You have a section where you talk about diet for patients with mold illness. And, you know, you mentioned your microbiome friendly math diet, but in there you also mentioned a low mold diet, a low FODMAP diet, and even a low histamine diet. And I, I think it's pretty common to typically recommend a low mold diet, which means foods that um, are actually fungi like mushrooms or food that may contain um, mold should be avoided? Yeah, I mean, usually there's some crossover that some of these foods that tend to be moldy, like alcohol and cheese and like conventional meats, grains. Um, there are also often, you know, histamine <laughs> related foods. Um, so are they just inflammatory foods? So mostly in our modern society, you're not going to get like a huge amount of mold from food. But when you're already dealing with it from your home and you're trying to recover, uh, you know, you don't want foods that are going to stimulate a reaction or more inflammation or a histamine release. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So it's not forever, but um yeah, there's generally going to be, you're going to you know, have to be on good behavior for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, why do you sometimes use a low FODMAP diet? Yeah, that one I learned about from Suzanne Bennett, who's Which in L.A. A too. Of mine, yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, she was one of my practitioners when I was sick, and she wrote a mitochondria book. and. Yep. She had the low FODMAP diet in there because she said the, the gases um, that are produced from digesting these foods are like a strain on your system. So I thought I might as well try it. So uh, I did it for a month and then I started reintroducing foods and I thought it was a really interesting experience. Um, you know, there's some foods I kind of kept out of my diet. Uh, so I think for certain people who are experiencing a lot of poor motility, SIBO, bloating, uh, it could be a good temporary diet for people. Yeah, I, I use it quite frequently for patients with SIBO, IBS. Yeah. 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 It doesn't, it doesn't have to be forever and it may not be every food on no, that list. No, you don't, you don't want to do it forever because you're excluding a lot of super healthy foods like broccoli. Yeah. 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 And for me, I just found like a couple foods were my biggest trigger and now like i i like actually grapes were one of them and i just Dressing. bought some this week and i <laughs> did fine with them all week so uh but there were some years where every time i had grapes or apples i would feel really bloated interesting why do you think that was well they're fodmops and right. those particular ones for some reason maybe because i don't eat them as much like garlic and onion were not a problem for me at all but maybe i right. ate those all the time so my body was more used to them i know apples can uh, especially apple juices can often be a source of mold right for yeah. sure right yeah when they say you know from concentrate 
<laughs> that's like right. it's bad you know they're they're really it's very processed um right. and it's not like you know they're picking the apple off the tree it's like kind of just dumping them in a barrel and smashing them up and making them into powder and then adding right. water <laughs> i remember seeing somebody uh cut open some of these um apple apple sauce uh that comes in these like squeezy containers and stuff and it was just horrible you couldn't believe the amount Ew. of mold in these squeeze any of these squeezy foods applesauce or yogurt or any of these kinds of things it, it's really bad oh wow i didn't know about that yeah yeah fruit juices can be one and i think you know just a side note as we feed our toddlers, you know, a lot of times we're giving them these kind of low quality processed things that, you know, crackers and juice boxes and stuff. And yeah, yeah, it's they're they're not clean foods. Yeah. And speaking of kids, um, I remember the same presentation. She showed some of these like bath toys, like, you know, the little rubber ducky and you cut it open and inside it's just really, you know, all this. Oh, yeah. Stuff. I've had that experience. Like you squeeze out the ducky and there's like mold coming out <laughs> and you're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> all right. Great. Um, so anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? Um, you know, I think we covered a lot of things. I think mostly if people just are curious and they want to get started, you're mostly curious about your home and that's often a, a great starting point, right? Cause it is your environment that affects right. your health. So even though I'm not as much of a home expert, you know, if you suspect it because you've been chronically ill, uh, or like you said, you might not even really suspect your home, but if you've been chronically ill, you're just going to doctor after doctor, you're not getting better, you know, we have some free ebooks on the website and blogs like just start informing yourself like could this be mold because if it is if it is uh you want to know about it because you're not going to get better without doing something about it good and so for uh resources for practitioners your book is an excellent resource yeah thank you yeah i definitely think it's an um detailed enough that a lot of practitioners are going to get out because as a practitioner i'm sure this happens for you people are like well which stuff can i keep and like how do i can find a good inspector <laughs> and like all these yeah. questions and yeah. so you know and you want to try to have answers so there's just so many questions so i think it's a great book for you know you're already out of the home and you're still healing or you're you know in the beginning it's just kind of the whole process yeah, I'm, speaking of that, um, I'm glad we talked about the ERMI test because I often recommend that. But every time I get the report back, it's like, well, um, it shows you have some mold. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard to read. You know, uh, you'll yeah. have to look at that ERMI code. I think it's only like $37 for people to enter their ERMI in there. So I think okay. that, that's a great innovation. Yeah, it's tough. Those first questions about the home are, it's, it's like a puzzle. And then you got all the types of mold and then you got the types of mycotoxins and then, you know, putting it all together is a bit tricky. Yes, it's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, any final thoughts? No, I really appreciate you actually reading the book. It warms my heart. So thank you so much. I worked very hard on that. Uh, I can really, really tell a like, labor of love, right? Yeah, I can really tell you're, you know, you're just learning and, and I really just appreciate you doing that and sharing it with your audience. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.